Hello and welcome to the Sports Grade Podcast. My name is Ryan Walker and with me is the left-footed Ruben Williams. How are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. All the best players of all time use their left foot. So uh, one of the better things I've grown up with. There's something about left-footed players, I must say. They just seem a little bit more skillful uh, than us rights, but um, mm. it's a weird one. It is a weird Lance, one. It's a phenomenon. Lance Franklin, Harry yeah. Kuehl, Sam Mitchell, you can do it with, with both. Yeah, and yourself. So. And me. <laughs> yeah. Um, massive episode today, so let's get cracking. Um, but first of all, a little message from our good friends at Deakin University, where every single course is backed by industry experts so you can be confident that you'll get the job you want with a degree that employers want. Deakin University, one of the great taglines here, progressive real-world learning. The show is also brought to you by our newly bought-in sponsor, which is Sports Where I Am. Uh, And they are great friends of ours. We've had a great relationship with them over the last few months, so it's great to have them on board. But Sports Where I Am... Give yourself a memorable summer to look forward to and head to www.sportswhereiam.com to find all your favorite sports. Plus, use the code SPORTSGRAD for 5% off tickets. So that is an awesome deal. Head there for all your tickets. It's very exciting. If you want to learn more about us and where who we are, where we came from, what we do, or you just want to ask us any questions at all, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn um, you can find a link to do so in the show notes. Now, Rubes, today I'm going to put it out there from the get go. This is my favorite episode of all time. Here we go, <laughs> and that, and we don't use that lightly. We really don't. I don't. I don't think that's ever been said before. We usually just say, "Yeah, it's in the top ten, top five. <laughs> but I'm going to put it out there and say this is my favorite one of all time. It was brilliant. Mainly because the guest that we have today is probably not an idol, but I think I've always thought he's an absolute ripper at what mm. he does. And, you know, you rarely see him make a mistake. So we'll do a little in- intro for him now. Our guest today is Hamish McLaughlin, who has been hosting on Channel 7 since 2008, having hosted the Brownlow Medal, the Australian Open, the Spring Racing Carnival the Olympics, as well as the AFL. You'll probably see him every Friday night on your TVs. Hamish, it's fair to say, has been one of the more prevalent media presenters of the past decade here in Australia. And it's an absolute privilege to have him join us on the podcast. So, Rubes, it was a riffer episode. Uh, What are some things that stood out to you? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Ryan. Hamish was brilliant. And he's had an incredible upbringing. Like he's been in the media industry since 2008. And he's had the fortunate experience of working under two of the greatest commentators of all time in Bruce McAvaney and Dennis Cometti. And he told a great story about how when he first got to Channel 7, he sat down with Bruce and Bruce gave him three bits of advice, which he's never forgotten and he's carried through. So we're learning from Bruce McAvaney as well through Hamish today, uh, Ryan, which was incredible to, to understand what goes into... Uh, the commentating of some of the biggest events in the world. Yeah, absolutely. It was great hearing him talk about Bruce and Dennis. You can tell he uh, he's learnt so much from them. Um, what I loved was just he spoke about the important points between commentating on radio versus TV and some of the things that he focuses on. And it's a completely different experience in terms of, you know, when you're listening, when you're viewing, but also how you're actually commentating the game. So, it was really interesting to hear. I mean, most people probably think it's the same thing. You're just calling what it is. But he, just the way he kind of spelt it out as it was different was was quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing he does, he talks with a lot of kids on the TV and he's got to connect with them beforehand to make sure it's a good show. He also does these other uh, TV segments where he's got to open up the players to get them to share their story um, in a really emotional way. And he can't just do that. He can't just go out and say, hey, you know, tell me your deepest, darkest thoughts or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's got to get to them beforehand. And so using some of those methods that he does to connect with people, he taught us how students or anyone going into an interview can connect with an interviewer. Because as he says, you know, if you've got two people who are equal on paper, 
you're going to go with the one who you like more. So if you can get emotionally connected to the interviewer, then you're going to have a much better chance of winning that job. Absolutely. Well, there's three things that really stood out to us. We think it's an absolute cracker. So enjoy this episode with Hamish McLaughlin. Hamish, welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast. Ryan, long time listener, you know, first time caller, excited to be here. What cap number am I? Like 120 something? Yeah, I think you're around that mark, which is, okay. uh, you know, it's a big number now. The 100 was big, but I think the 120 odd is even bigger. So, um, no, <laughs> yeah. we've been a long admirer of yours. So, it's been a, a long path to get you on the, the podcast. So, thank God you're here. Well, your future father-in-law, Mark Hunter, was the one that said, you haven't replied to Ryan on email. And as a result, we're all here together. <laughs> yeah, I um, and obviously, shout out to Mark. He'd be listening. But um, mm. yeah, I put a bit of pressure on Mark to, to get your details. So when you did take my call, I was somewhat surprised, but also stoked to, to finally get you. Um, well, there's a couple of parts of this. One is we're recording this on Mark Hunter's birthday. I think he's 56 or something today. Yeah. Last weekend when the Bulldogs were playing Essendon, and I know we're dating this podcast, but you know this is giving everyone a feel for when it was recorded. Essendon were playing the Western Bulldogs in Launceston. He walked in the morning to go and see where the ground was, got attacked by a spur-wing plover, ducked the spur-wing <laughs> plover, tore the quad off his bone, rolled down an embankment and basically had three or four hours just in the wilderness. He's had an operation, <laughs> I think, since. So things change pretty quickly. That's the first bit about Mark Hunter. The second is to do this podcast, you had to commit to marry his daughter. So congratulations on your potential <laughs> and or future engagement, Ryan. That's great news. No, well, thank you. Thank you. We have, we've talked a lot about the, the Love Grad podcast, an extension of this. So perhaps there's a few stories in there for that. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I mean, I've got a dog with Lauren. I'm about to move in with Lauren. So I guess the logical step that's all fine. is to push that, into that, that. That's all fine. But what we know, Ruben and I know from this conversation is you are committing at some point, probably before the grand final in Perth this year, to make uh, Lauren an honest woman. Well done. I Excellent. might also just add to that. When I first spoke to you, you actually said to me, okay, like maybe I could do this, but are you going to are you gonna marry Mark's daughter? Yeah. And I had to say that to you. So yeah. well, now you've got to say it to Lauren. That's it's all on record. Saying. So yeah. there we go. Records yeah. in the public now. I look yeah. forward to the <laughs> celebration. <laughs> yeah. How many people listen into the Sports Grab podcast? Uh, thousands from all around okay. the world. Thousands know, now know. Lauren doesn't, but she will soon. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Good on you guys. Thanks for that. Thanks for putting that on me. Awesome. But... I look forward to the uh, the wedding podcast. But um, yeah. Hamish, to you, I, I was listening to an interview that you did prior to this, uh, and you mentioned a, um, a moment that you and your brother shared at the AFL Brownlow one night where you were kind of talking to each other saying, isn't this odd? Like two brothers from a small town of what, 250 people, yeah. one hosting, one running the entire event. You know, how did we get here? Where did, um, where did like uh, the love for sports media come for you? And how did you end up, you know, end up in that uh, odd position? I sort of, Ruben, stumbled into the sports media game. I wanted to be a, I grew up in South Australia. We're in a small country town, as you alluded to, Mount Pleasant, 260 people, I think, still in between sort of the Adelaide Hills and the Barossa Valley. I wanted to play for Nord in an in a SNFL grand final as it was back then. I used to write to the Nord footy club, the Red Legs, and get posters signed by players and sent back to the house and have it above the wall. Or I wanted to play Davis, uh, Davis Cup tennis for Australia. Neither of those things happened. I, I could play tennis pretty well. I was in the top handful of my age in the state. And then I blew my knee up, had nine knee operations. And then I think Jerry Maguire came out as I was um, about to do commerce. Had a look at um, all sort of things and wanted to be involved in sports. So I ended up working for Craig Kelly, who bizarrely used to play for the Red Legs. He was my first employee, ended up being a part of the wedding party years later. Uh, and Davis Cup Tennis, my hero was Pat Cash and John Fitzgerald growing up, ended up calling tennis with Fitzy. But how I ended up getting to the media was working with Craig Kelly. I headed up his events and entertainment division. And I, used, I always liked talking, was happy talking. And I used to find it sort of odd that I would pay an MC to host an event when I could get up and save that budget line as head of events. So I would just get up and stand up and talk. And one day a guy called Lewis Martin was in one of the events. He happened to be in charge of sales at Channel 7. 
Ian Johnson was head of Channel 7. Lewis said, there's a guy that I've heard can talk a bit. Why don't you get him to come and do a sort of a pilot? Did a pilot. Um, one thing led to another. And I ended up being given a show called Game Day back in 2008. When I was doing the pilot, they gave me auto cue to read. Now, I was lucky. Parents educated me very well, spent way too much money on me to be such a poor reader. When I was <laughs> reading the auto cue, I was terrible. And the guy said, you know, you're sort of not what we're looking for. I said, can I come back tomorrow, bring some people back in and do sort of a panel discussion? They said, no, 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 no. So please, can we have one more go at it? They said, right, I come back tomorrow. So I brought back, it was Grant Hackett, uh, I think Michael Glim, Andrew Thompson, who I was living with, Gillen, who was at the AFL but wasn't really where he is now. I think Nick Holland and maybe Bucks. And we had this panel discussion. They said, that's better. You know, one thing led to another. I ended up on game day, which led to horse racing in the spring, which led to tennis, you know, which led to Brownlows and Olympics and been unbelievably lucky along the way. But it was all a bit fortuitous. Yeah, right. I, I remember, um, and you wouldn't remember this at all, but I think it was, might have been Melbourne Cup 2017. And you were strolling on the, uh, on the straight, um, obviously doing your broadcast thing or something. And me Walking having down a, to the barriers before the cup, probably. It, it might have been, yeah. And I'd had a few too many sherbets, and I actually shouted out at you. I said, <laughs> "Coffee, paper, Sunday game day." <laughs> and you were just like, "What the hell?" But you're like, "Yeah, mate, like go game day." So a bit of a memory for me. Um, well, you, you, I, I've discovered over the years that the later in the day at Flemington or Caulfield or Mooney Valley the more comfortable people get at talking to yeah. And that is as a result of the more sherbets they've had. And yeah. if you ignore them, they then become abusive. If mm. you get involved and have a chat, it's very good fun. The drama is when you're on a timeline to get to the barrier, it's a mixture of I need to be friendly and have a chat, but I can't actually miss the cross because the Melbourne <laughs> Cup starts at 3 o'clock. So I would have yeah. hopefully said good day, but continued yeah. to walk as if I had somewhere to be. No, you... You were very friendly. So, um, yeah, I, I took that with me, which was great. Okay. Um, what, what's the hardest thing about broadcasting on air? And, and are there still some parts to what you do that you constantly are looking to improve and, and get better at? Yeah, I, I think always. You know, Bruce is one of the greatest multi sport broadcasters the world has ever seen, not just Australia. And he says, I'm always learning. And you know, whether he is or not, I'm not sure, but you're always taking things away. And, yeah, my mum rides a lot. She rode for Australia in the dressage. And when she's teaching someone that's never been on a horse before, she says she'll always learn something about what not to do or balance or how to have the hands or something. You're always observing. I'll be watching Bruce and I'll see something I love and think, you know, I should be doing more of that. Or I'll listen to myself and think, oh, that was, I thought I was doing a good job at the time. You're always observing. And there's a few things, though, that I think are um, absolutes you've got to do a heap of preparation so that you can tell the viewer or the listener something new or something interesting you're always trying to help the viewer there's no point highlighting something that can be seen you're always i think trying to be conversational no one wants to be lectured to everyone wants to have a conversation that's something that i'm always trying to do bruce gave me a great bit of advice years ago he said three things he said do the preparation he held his arms out and said do this much you'll only need this much but you never know which that is, so do it all. Don't wear anything you're uncomfortable with because you'll be focused on that and not doing the job. And the third he said was, don't try and be someone else because you'll be a very bad version of them. Always try and be the best version of you. And that's been great advice. And that's something that you need to be comfortable with. Now, I'm, you know, it's a very personal thing, broadcasting. People like some, people dislike the others. We all know that we're not going to appeal to everyone, but I think trying to be the best version of you makes broadcasting easier. And I like to try and tell stories and try and take people inside the sport, inside the athlete's mind, introduce the athlete to the viewer so that they can support and cheer knowing people a bit better. Um, try not to tell people something they know. Try not to tell people something they see. Try not to be too obvious. Try not to be too technical. I mean, we could go on and on and on about <laughs> what there is, but yeah, it, it's, it's complicated. The other thing that I would say to a broadcaster is don't look online because yeah. it's not pretty yeah. for anyone. And I'm pretty thin-skinned. And the other thing is any good stuff isn't good enough and the bad stuff destroys you. So I'm not on social. 
I'm very aware that there's positives and a heap of negatives, but I, I'm aware of that being the case for everyone. So I don't take it too personally. If I went and looked, I'd be the shell of the man that I am. Yeah. Um, I take, say that to young footballers too. I said, don't open that door. They will do, but they come back yeah. here later and say, actually, I don't know. Mm. You, you mentioned that piece around preparation from Bruce. Yep. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you had a conversation with him right at the start of your career. Yep. Do you do any preparation for, for, preparation for that and think, all right, I'm meeting with Bruce. What am I going to ask him? Or was yeah. it just an open conversation? He just spilled everything. Now, Ruben, you and I have never met, but I already know you've done a lot of work on me. <laughs> and as a result, you know the questions to ask. And that is the same for us. If I'm going to go and meet a first gamer, where did they grow up? How did they fall in love with football? What are the mm. parents' names? Do they have siblings? Who have the biggest influences been? You know, that Brownlow's coming up in a few weeks. Mm. Who are the yeah. 12 or 15 players that might win the Brownlow? over them so we work that out now i've got to go and ring them all talk through their lives find out what they love what they don't love who are the influences where are the hardships been who have the heroes been what images can you send me so that when the interview comes hopefully you're ready for a good interview now mm. whether i'm meeting bruce or someone sends me a message saying can you do a message for ryan walker he's just been come engaged and <laughs> da, 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 da. then you need to know the storyline so that it's yeah. not just a hi mate Tameish, well done in your engagement. Like that doesn't really help anyone. Mm, yeah. But you know, if you know that they bought a dog, bought a house, Mark Hunter's been urging them to get engaged for a long time. <laughs> you know, how did they meet? What have the hiccups been? You know, where are they going to get married? Who's going to be there? It, it helps the narrative, and that's what you're always trying to do. And that, what, that's what Bruce is saying. He's saying like, do this much, you only need this, but make sure mm. you know it all. And that's whether you're doing the Olympics or the Brownlow Medal yeah. or you know, doing an Auskick interview. Like, what's the kid's name? Where has he come from? Who does he love? Who does he support? How many kids, how many siblings does he have? What's his dog's name? Are the goldfish still alive? What are the pieces of information I can find out before we go live on air in front of a million people to make it a better mm. interview? Mm. Yeah. So you, will you actually ring each player individually before the brown low? Like you wouldn't do just general online research. It's no, almost I'll like you've got to go straight to the source and get the info from there, from there yeah. now. So you ring the players and you'll have an hour and maybe more and a few chats and texts and exchanges and continue right. to ask bits and pieces. And you'll do that. I'll do that with probably the top 12 in the betting probably this year. Now, Bont and Wines and Oliver are the three most likely. Yeah. But if one of those don't win, yeah, there is probably 10 that can. Yeah. I don't want to be caught out not knowing you know, the information on those guys. So, yeah, the conversations happen. Then you speak to the parents, speak to the teammates, ring a junior coach. You know, you could continue to do that, you know, for the next month. Now, I've only got a couple of weeks. So I need to, you know, make sure I use the time efficiently. But, you know, hopefully that shows out a little bit in the interview that yeah. he's done the work and it was a good interview. You can do an interview, but did you find the photo of the junior football moment that he was talking about? Did you speak to the president of the Kaibi Bolite Footy Club like we did with Lockie Neal and find out? the goal that he kicked as a junior in the seniors that showed that and they're the things. And Bruce is the best of that. There were 11,000 athletes at the Tokyo Olympics. 2,000 were doing the track and field. Bruce could have named every one of them, told you his partner's name or her partner's name, the dog's name, the street they lived at, and their star sons. Like, <laughs> that's why he's the best of all time. Yeah. Well, I, remember, I remember one particular stat around like the, the javelin world record that was last broken by someone from Sweden in like 1924 or something ridiculous, just pulled it yeah. straight out of a hat. And you can tell, you know, how good he is in that yeah. moment. But um, no one's done more work, Ruben, than Bruce mm. prepping for the work they've done. And I, I say that not thinking I'm right. I just know no one could have done more. Mm. Yeah. With the interviews that you would do with the players on the Brown Line night, um, you've obviously got to establish a connection with them so you can tell their story. Um, one of the other platforms where you're interviewing people, which is probably a lot deeper and there's a lot more emotion involved, is that piece that you did around the last time I cried. Yep. And I've listened to a few of them and you simply open with, when was the last time you cried? Now, imagine if Ryan or I asked somebody, when was the last time you cried? Well, you wouldn't get the same response out of them. So what, what are the things that you do behind the scenes and in preparation for that to allow someone to share that sort of information? I think, Ruben, with everything, it's about building up trust and building a relationship where they know you're not going to abuse a relationship or compromise them or have them feel uncomfortable. And 
if you can do that, you generally, it's like anything, you know, it's with the relationship you have you with your wife or your partner or your kids or your best mates or your colleagues. If you can build that emotional connection with whoever it is, life is a lot simpler. If you can build the trust within it, then I think you get a much more open conversation along the way. I, I'll often say, you know, with game day, you spoke about, it. we don't do the show anymore because COVID sort of crueled it, but I would always say to the footballers when they sat down, what don't you want to talk about? And they would say, really? I said, yeah, if you don't want to talk about it, let's remove that as a fear for you. And then we can talk about what you want to, and it's going to be a fun show. And as a result of that, they got rid of this sort of defensive feel and they knew that that wasn't going to come up. And as a result, there was great chat. And it's a bit the same with the Oz kickers. Have a quick three minutes, talk about things, have chat. I'm not going to, you know, bite you, don't be annoyed introduce them to the cameraman, introduce them to Jan Cameron, who does all the prep for us, have them feel like it's a fun, casual environment. You know, Michael Parkinson, who's one of the best interviewers of all time, said the, the environment they used to walk out to, whether it be Muhammad Ali or David Beckham or whoever, doors would open, they'd walk out with the lights on them, there'd be 500 people in the crowd, there'd be a band playing, then they'd walk across the set like it is the most uncomfortable scenario. So how do I make them more comfortable before they get there? And what he would always do, and I've always done this, is how do I have time with them beforehand, have the conversation beforehand so that when we hit record, nothing's going to startle them and it's much easier and much more comfortable. And once you've had half an hour with someone, you know what sort of a personality they are, what they like, what they don't like, what are the fun stories to go to, what are the buttons you need to push and... And so it all becomes easier. So long-winded answer, but try and get to them beforehand. Try and have them disarmed by making them uh, trust you. So it sounds like the key component in that is just like acknowledging the potential negative that could put them off. I think so. And I think once you've done that, they see you as someone who is an ally, not a foe. Mm. Someone who mm. wants to have a great conversation, not you know, sideswipe them and catch them and try and find a headline. That's sort of not mm. my go. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. We have a lot of listeners who are students who are reaching out to people in the industry who are having conversations to go, you know, to find out what they do in their career and if there's any job opportunities. Is And one of the potential um, things that gets them nervous is that these people don't have time for them and they worry that, um, you know, they're going to come across in the wrong way. Is there anything that you think a student could perhaps say to someone, say they're meeting with Ryan Walker, what could they say to Ryan Walker to make Ryan feel more comfortable about giving him his time to a student coming through? Um, so just to break that question down, how do you... How might a student make Get in front of a, people making the decisions. Yeah, how might a student make a person in the industry more comfortable to talk with them? Yeah. Uh, I, I always think a mutual link or a common link or a uh, like Ryan when he's on Mark Hunter's daughter's boyfriend it's like okay <laughs> so just suddenly there's I like Mark I think Mark and I get on well I'll try and do something that helps people progress when it's a complete cold call it's trickier but I always think an email gets I'll tell you what I've got right now I've got bad eyes so I'm squinting I've got 378 unread emails, 679 unread text messages. So it's like, am I going to get to them? No. And by the time we've done this podcast, there'll be 700. And, you know, it's like, so how do I get a direct line? And for me, I always say to people, ring me. You know, like I, I'm, a, I hope very personable and accessible. When people have great enthusiasm, I always try and respect that. When people are passionate, I try and respect that. When people are really talented, I try and foster that. So how do I get, like, let's try and think of a job you want. How do I get to Channel 7? Well, you guys have got to me. Now, if I like you guys, I'll try and get you to the right people at Channel 7. So it, it, as always, it's this ability to find a connection and to find a way to get to the people, as opposed to hope that the CV, which is often brilliant, gets noticed in the pile of CVs. Now, the other thing that I think about is, we're living in 2021. A CV seems to be something that was sent around in 1950. So what are we doing 71 years later? Surely we're doing something different. I would be looking to send an incredible video 
with all the emotional touch points that highlights what I do, how I've done it, that is noticeable. Now, if I'm walking around, I get a text that says, hi, Hamish, Mark Hunter's son-in-law, um, I'd love you to take 40 seconds to look at this. I'll probably click it while I'm waiting for the coffee. Because shit, that's impressive. And then if Ryan says, click this to do X and Y, it's like, click. Like, tell me that we're not better than a CV in 2021 at getting people's mm. attention. Mm. Yeah. You guys are all clever guys. You know how to, well, most of you know how to work this squadcast. <laughs> <laughs> but when I get a link, I just click it. When you tell me there's a link that, it's like when I said to you, just send me the link, it'll be in the diary. <laughs> If yeah. I have to reply to an email, download, so I'm not doing it. Yeah. But if you can break down the system and make it easy um, and impress, do that. You know, yeah. I remember a mate of mine, uh, Jonathan Pease was his name. He wanted a, a job with a New York advertising agency. He kept ringing and ringing and ringing and writing and writing and writing and CV and CV and CV. One day he went and got a, an arm from a mannequin um, and a leg and he put them in a, um, uh, a box and got the delivery company to deliver it to the agency. He said, you won't return my calls. You won't return my uh, emails. You haven't se- I replied to my CV that I've sent in. Make, and I said, I can't make it any clearer that I'd give an arm and a leg to work for your agency. And he said, please call this number, which he'd written on the arm. The guy rang, he said, okay, you got my attention. That's so good. <laughs> persistence at its best and the other thing is whoever is listening you'll get knocked back you'll get back knocked back over and over and over again do not take a knockback as uh finality don't take the the non-communication don't take the non-callback don't just keep going at it keep going at it keep going at it it's good advice well, Ryan, Ryan I missed lately. your email, Ryan, initially, right? Yeah, no, said to, You exactly. obviously said to Mark, Hamish hasn't replied. Mark texts me and says, reply to Ryan. I said, what? He said, well, there's an email that you haven't replied to. So it's like, I don't know. Uh, Just keep going. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't remember that. And I, I was kind of embarrassed when Mark did say reply to him. But like, as you say, like, keep if you going. don't get something, go, go another way or find yeah. another avenue to get it. All right. So so just, just in terms of the... Um, we're still at 679, we're at 382 on the end. Like, literally, there is 379 emails. <laughs> and oh, someone's ringing another you. Call coming. Like, <laughs> it doesn't end. Oh, it just doesn't end. Not now, Glenn. Not now. <laughs> Not now. He's the producer of Saturday Night Power. I'm on a podcast. Hey, Glenn, I'm on a podcast. With a couple of kids. I said, I've got to take this call, but I'll ring you back. Is that right? <laughs> All right. See you, mate. That is unreal. But Glenn Postel, he, he's, the, he's the producer. He's the you know, the primetime Olympics, he produced mm, it. Yeah. Is, you should get him on as one of your, um, yeah, let him know. <laughs> he does, you know, like he's the guy in my ear that goes, mate, we're going to the hockey. We go to the hockey. It's rained out. We're going to go to the modern bit. Sorry. That's not, like, he's, oh, what he's, in the area. he's a genius. Yeah. He'll do the, I've done two brown lows with him. I did Sunday footy with him for years with Dennis. Um, he's a great fella. Unbelievably talented. I'll give you his. So here you go. I'll give you. His, there we go. Work on the podcast, but fantastic. I'll text you both his number because he's the sort of guy that will give your students. I'll do it now because if I don't do it now, I'll forget. <laughs> um, all right, Glenn Postle, to Ryan Walker, share contact. Awesome. We're on. Ryan, That's who's good. the other bloke you've been trying to get on the podcast? Uh, well, I'm trying to get Tommy Mitchell on the podcast, um, have but have been number? able to get in touch with Tom. <laughs> you got his uh, number. The other guy, and it would be the second time that I've actually interviewed this particular fellow, and that's Gil. Um, 0, so 4, maybe 8, 10. <laughs> They're the first six. I won't give you the rest. Ooh, <laughs> some people will find that out. Um, and shout out to Gil. He'll be listening in quarantine in Perth at the moment as well. So um, we've spoken a lot about preparation, Hamish. And I remember when, we, when I first rang you, you, you said to me, Mate, I'm flat stick at the moment. I've got the Olympics coming up in, I think it was maybe three weeks. Um, can we maybe chat when I get back? And I was like, great, no problem. But that just kind of shows, you know, how much preparation goes into that. Can you sort of take us through, like, for events such as the Olympics or the AFL Grand Final, like, events of that, of that magnitude, like, what is the individual steps that you go through to prepare for, say, the Olympics? They're all different, Ryan, but in the end, 
it's just hours and hours of work. And, and, and it's, you can do it one of two ways. You can do hours and hours of work that are wasted because you'll never get to handball. As an Australian broadcast host, we're never going to the handball. We're most unlikely to go to sport climbing and we're highly unlikely to go to too much rowing, particularly at prime time at night because mm. it's dark on course. So you go, so what is it that we're most likely to do? And then you say, how am I going to know that? I'll go and get the Olympic uh, schedule. Then you sit down with Glenn Postel, who just rang, and say, Glenny, how does it look night one through to night 17? This is where we think we're going. Then you distill it down. You say, okay, so we're going to be hardcore swimming. There's 35 yeah. dolphins on the team. I need to know them all really well. Then in the second week, it's athletics. And there's 2,000 track and field athletes. What are we most likely to go to? And you start to distill it down. So I need to know the Australian track and field team. Then you go, well, the boomers, the hockey roos, the kookaburras, the opals, da, 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 da. So you've got to do the work, but you've got to do smart work, if that makes sense. There's no point spending three days on um, handball. There's just, you're not going to speak about the Slovakian handball team once. You might do a, the handballs on 7 May, Slovakia is playing the United States. That's sort of it. So then you go back and say, how long would I spend on the Olympics? I was reading probably a year out on sections of the paper and on websites that I otherwise wouldn't just to brush up, but not hardcore. But then a month out, I would then completely change my week from doing largely football on Brownlow to really who is now qualified for the Australian team, who is out, how is it looking? Where are we sitting yeah. rank-wise? Who are the kookaburras really going to be threatened by? Is it Belgium and the Netherlands? What have they done in the world? And start to work out the narratives of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. But you're basically going, you know, you guys are studying at the moment, you've done, like, you're going to swap back, really, whether that's the Olympic swap back or Brownlow swap back or final swap back. And, you know, my, my kids at the start of the year when I thought that COVID was going to be a nightmare, they decided to do term... Uh, last week of term two at Mount Buller Primary, um, snow squad holidays, and then term three. I haven't seen them much because they're up on the mountain. Because I, and then I went up on the mountain for a week, but I said to Soph and the kids, I'll see you. I'll walk you to school. I'll pick you up from school. But in between, I'm just flat out at nights. Then you work, you're doing 12, 13 hour days, trying to not, not to embarrass yourself in front of a few million people every night of the Olympics. Mm. So it becomes all encompassing. Yeah, Bruce was doing three hours sleep a night when he was doing the Olympics. What? And he's done that for three weeks leading in and he'd done a year's prep. And that's why I say to you, he's the greatest of all time. They yeah. say never meet your heroes. Bruce was always an idol and hero of mine. I met him and he went from hero to God you know, within the first meeting. And since then, he's become a colleague, a friend, a sort of a second father, a little guru that you look at and look to for advice. And he's the guy that you know, I get more pleasure out of working with than anyone else. He and Dennis have been the two guys that the last 15 years have been worth it because I've met yeah. those two guys and worked with those two guys. They're just, they're just such wonderful people. When, when it comes to commentating AFL, you've got to do what half an hour stints at a time. It's a completely different kind of ball game to, you know, addressing the Olympics. How do you learn those sort of skills and what's important to delivering the commentary in a really good way? Uh, take football commentary. You can't get a player wrong. So player ID becomes number one. You've just got to know who you're looking at and what they're doing. And then radio and TV is very different. Radio, when I haven't done Triple M for a few years, but I called Triple M for, I think it was nine years. When you're calling radio... Somebody that gave me the advice early on was saying, assume you're talking to a blind man or woman and help them with what is happening. So the detail is really important. So if you're calling radio, the ball spills at half forward, Christian Petrarca picks it up 55 metres from gold member side of the MCG, demons down by five. So if you say that, then Petrarca, you can see where he is. You know how far out he is, and you've got the score. Uh, they, they said, where is it? Who's got it? What's the score? That's radio. Where is it? Who's got it? What's the score? Whereas in TV, it's very different. Richie Ben always says, don't tell me something I can see. So then 
how, what do you say? And one of the, Saul Stein, who was the head of sport when I arrived at seven said, don't be afraid to let the sounds of the game tell the story. You know, the start, you know, what does that mean? Like if the crowd is roaring and the umpire is talking to the player, don't interrupt that. If you can add something to it, do. So radio and TV are different. Radio is around who is it, where is it, what's the score? TV is around enha enhancing the pictures. And, and they're different. But if you, if you get a player wrong, in my view, and we all do, you've had a bad call. If you get all the players right, that's B+. Plus. If you can then enhance it for the viewer in some way, shape or form, A-. Minus, and anything better than that's good. So, so in that string uh, of who's got it, where is it, what's the score, you know, you delivered that seamlessly. I think if Ryan or I tried to do it, there'd be um, ah, stutter, whatever. Does that stuff just come naturally or have you had to work on that? Uh, I think you work on it. I think, you know, you're always getting better at whatever you do. What does Malcolm Gladwell say? 10,000 hours, you know, mm. it's something to become an expert in it. The more you do, the better it is. The more you ride the bike, the more you surf, you know, the more you skateboard. And the more you find your own self, the more you find your own rhythm, the more you find your own way to do it what has helped me a lot particularly in hosting which is different from calling like you talk about the olympics i host i don't call the football i can either host i host friday i'm hosting tonight giants geelong i'll call tomorrow night melbourne brisbane calling and hosting are two different mediums you know hosting i've been i've i've become a lot more comfortable by hosting a lot of events you know standing on the stage at palladium you know, in front of 1,500 people, not being broadcast has helped me when I get to the broadcast. You might have noticed that I like to walk and talk when I do things with the Olympics or whatever it is. I think that's because of what I did, or what I've done a lot over the last 15 years, hosting events, charity events or corporate events. Or I like to walk and talk and tell stories. That, so that look, that looked particularly good with uh, Ian Thorpe, I must say. Yes, and Thorpe, yeah. what a, how brilliant was he during the mm. Olympics explaining what yeah. he was seeing and what had happened? So the other thing, you know, talk around, tell your story, your way is what I'm big on. I don't really like a lectern. When the event manager says, how do you want to do it? You send me the notes. I'll try and remember them, but I'll tell the story my way. I won't read them verbatim. I'll me memorize them, walk and talk, lapel versus the handheld, you know, lapel versus the lectern and, and do my own thing a bit. You know, it's everyone's got their own way. I can't really remember what the question was, but it, the, 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 the piece is around finding a way to tell the story or to commentate in a way that you're comfortable with so that the ums and the ahs and the awkwardness aren't there. Mm. Yeah. And the storytelling piece, like a lot of our grads, they're going into interviews and they're trying to pitch to someone like the AFL or Cricket Australia why they should employ them. And we try and encourage people to give a really compelling reason why this job is important to them or yeah. And so what, what are some things that students can use to tell their story better? Because, you know, they, these people, perhaps, you know, they're not AFL players. They ha haven't gone to the Olympics. Um, they're people going into regular jobs. How do you tell your own story and make it compelling to an organisation? I think passion's clearly important. If you're passionate and enthusiastic, then you grab the attention of the employer. Like I think passion and enthusiasm takes you a long way. Being extremely knowledgeable is uh, very helpful. I mean, you, you want someone who's passionate, enthusiastic and knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So if you can be those things, big ticks and you're giving yourself a chance. Being curious you know, and being interested versus interesting. So if I'm going into an interview with Ryan, I, 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 would, be doing, I would be doing as much work on Ryan as I would be the organisation or the job itself. Where did Ryan grow up? Does he have siblings? Is he married or not? Does he have kids? What are the hardships he's been through in life? What are the shared interests? Because if, if I can connect with Ryan and show that I've done the work on him, that sort of naturally means you'd probably do the work in the role. And, you know, as opposed to, I come in knowing nothing about Ryan, knowing, showing no interest in Ryan, being sort of lacking passion, knowledge or enthusiasm. So they're, they're little things, but I guess they're things that, show that you would do the work like we all follow I, I know if i if i ask you the next few questions i think i know the answers to these questions 
when Roger Federer plays Novak Djokovic, who, put your hand up if you want Roger, Roger Federer to win. What, when Roger Federer plays Andy Murray, put your hand up if you want Roger Federer to win. Yeah. So, so it is because he's told his story better and you've emotionally connected with him and you've fallen in love with him over the years, more so than you have Novak or Andy. So it, it's sort of just common sense that if you can connect with the interviewer and have them emotionally connect with you, the hand goes up when they've got to make a decision whether they're going to employ Ryan or Ruben. I connected with Ryan. I didn't quite connect with Ruben because the CVs are both brilliant. Who am I going with? Human nature says the guy that I connected both with and want to spend more time with. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Or that just absolutely no, right? absolutely. No, it's, it's brilliant. Like we had Morgan Mitchell on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And we asked her, what are your future career aspirations? What do you want to do after you finish running? And she spoke about some of these causes that were really important to her and why she wanted to, to um, pursue them. And we were speaking afterwards that if you put that in front of anybody, nobody's going to knock you back because of the reasons of why you've just presented it. And so I think there's a lot that people can carry into their interviews because I think they perhaps focus too much on these are the skills I've got and these and how I can use them. Yeah. Um, text check. Where are we at? In terms of text messages? Yeah. <laughs> They'll be growing. Uh, we're still at 679 texts. We're at 387 emails. And in terms of unread, uh, unheard voice mails, we're at 156. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, All right, we'll, we'll continue to watch that number grow. Um, because I don't, I don't listen to the voicemails. I just see that, like the last, can you see it in that? Dave Matthews just rang then, so he's, I'm doing the Giants tonight. I rang and just asked about Sam Taylor, and he just rang back. I'm not going to listen to the voicemail he just left. I'm just going to ring him back. At yeah. some point, I've got to work out how to clear the 156 <laughs> voicemails, of which probably 27 are from mum, 15 from my mad aunt, and three or four from my wife. <laughs> fair enough okay um we've spoken about bruce and dennis a bit tonight that obviously um influential people um that have had an impact on your career yeah going back to when you like sort of first started you first thought i'm gonna have a crack at uh in the media and broadcasting were there some mentors that you had along the way that you learned some really valuable lessons from early on in your career bruce and dennis they're the two. Just them two. The well, if you say to me, who have you learned <laughs> most from? Bruce and Dennis. Because yeah. the, the, the beauty about those two were I was coming in as a 2008, I was uh, 32. I'm of no threat to them. They're mm. the best in the world at what they do and they're completely comfortable in their own skin. So what they decided to do was to help a guy become better as opposed to some that say well he could take my job i'm not helping him yeah. but bruce and dennis because they're the best in the world at what they did and they could work at seven for as long as they wanted to because seven will just continue to offer them contracts thought you know i can help and what happened was you know that they would show me the way to do things and i would observe and they would say you know is there anything you need help with there or they would i'll give you an example i, I, I tell i tell this story to highlight I'll tell you two stories, one on each. So we, Bruce and I would always do a thing pre-game on a Friday night when he was doing Friday night football on seven, mate. And at the end of that show, I would ask Bruce, what have you loved during the week? And he would talk about a sport or a sporting event that he's seen that he loved. And in the pre-game meeting, he said to me, let's talk about Queens, the lead up to Wimbledon. This is when Channel 7 had Wimbledon. Jordan Thompson from New South Wales beat Andy Murray. And he said to me, yeah, that's the first time that Andy Murray has lost to an Australian. I said, no, I, I didn't know that. And he said, Andy Murray was 19 and 0 going into that match. He never lost a raft at a Leighton, Philip Bruce. No, it's like, right, right. We go on air. And I say to Bruce, right, Bruce, where are we going to go? Bruce and the loose, take us somewhere around the world. Bruce says, I want to take you to Queens. Jordan Thompson this week, he defeated Andy Murray. Hamish, you said to me before we started this show, that Andy Murray had never been beaten by an Australian. You told me he was 19 and I did not know that. It's like, so the generosity of Bruce yeah. to make those who he's working with look fantastic, feel confident, and be the best they can be, like very few That's people unreal. I've ever met before. Dennis just has an amazing ability to draw you with him and be better just because he, I think, the greatest caller 
of all time in terms of uh, I love his voice, I love his tone. Bruce, I think, is the best sports broadcaster, multi-sport ever. Dennis, for me, best football commentator. I was working on Triple M doing Sundays and I would do Sundays and love it. And Bruce and Dennis were doing Sundays on seven. Bruce was starting to cut back on work and gave up Sunday football. Lewis Martin, the guy in making the decision at Channel 7, the boss at 7, rang me and said, hey, there's an opportunity to do Sunday football on 7. You are doing Triple M at the moment. He hadn't even finished the sentence. I said, no, I'm coming to 7. I was already doing um, Saturday afternoons with 7. I said, no, no, Sunday. Who's it with? He said, Dennis, I'm coming. For five years, Dennis and I did Sunday afternoon football. My favourite half an hour of the week was Dennis... The siren would go. I'd throw to the six o'clock news. Big um, crowd at Marvel or MCG. Dennis would put, I don't know why, I think he took them from the buffet at the hotel, but he'd bring out a couple of scones. He and I would just have a scone till about 6.30 and talk about life. Greatest half an hour of my week, every week without fail. And when he uh, retired in 2016 and he called the Bulldogs final, which they won, and he bizarrely enough had been on the Bulldogs list. Not many people know this, but Jason Johannesson won the Norm Smith medal wearing number 39. Guess what jumper Den wore at the Bulldogs? 39. Wow. <laughs> so Dennis and Bruce, for me, if you, yeah. if you want to do another podcast, and I'll just give my favourite 300 stories on Dennis and Bruce, we can do <laughs> the best. We'd easily be able to fill a good yeah. couple of hours with them, I'm sure. I think so. I think so. Um, Hamish, a couple more questions. Um, you spoke a lot about Bruce and Dennis, and there's plenty of advice from there, out, outside of them and perhaps outside of media and commentary, what's the best piece of career or, or life advice you've received? Um, I'll give you a few thoughts. First of all, 7 billion people, or whatever up to 8 billion, 9 billion people experience today differently. Be very aware of everyone. Be empathetic towards everyone. Michael Parkinson did his first TV show and the guy that got him into the TV was sitting alongside him and they finished the first show and Michael Parkinson said, oh, let's go out and celebrate. And he said, not before you thank everyone in this room. Cameramen, wardrobe, makeup, lighting, floor manager, like they are the people that are making you look really good. And they all are there wanting probably to do other things in their life. Um, they've all got problems in their life. Be empathetic. I, I sent my... I sent my kids this message the other day. I've got a five-year-old, seven-year-old, a nine-year-old. I have to send the message to my wife to make sure that she gets it to the kids. But I read this the other day. We talk about bumper stickers and other bits and pieces. But uh, three things in life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. The third is to be kind. So if you're in the media, that works really well. If you're a doctor, that works really well. If you're a husband, a father, a sister, a brother, just be kind to people. The other thing that I loved, and a friend of mine called Janie Martino, who's very good on these bits and pieces, um, she sent me this. She said, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. If you're always comparing yourself to others, you're going to steal happiness from yourself and joy from yourself because there's always someone who's got more. Yeah, you know, they've got the better job. They've got the faster car, the newer car, the bigger house, the bigger swimming. It's like, don't compare. Just be happy with whatever is that you have. We've got more than 99% of the world as it currently stands. You guys are both currently in your rooms, roof, warm, clothes, food in the fridge, money in the bank. It's like, how lucky are we all? So, you know, be kind. Don't compare yourself to others. Be happy with what it is that you have right now. You're going to go a long way, I think. Awesome. That's unbelievable advice. Um, last question for you. And I know when this goes out, the grand final will be this weekend. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a tough one, but who is going to win the AFL grand final? All right. So you, we're all sitting here Friday morning. Geelong play the Giants tonight. Dogs, Lions tomorrow night. Let's let's do yeah. this. What do we? This is mm. the sports grad predictor. Yeah, yeah. Cats, I think, beat the Giants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really torn tomorrow night. I sort of think the dogs are finding their rhythm, but the Lions don't lose much at the Gabba. Yeah. 
They've only lost once at the Gabba this year. They only lost once last year. That was a final. I'm going to go the dogs to beat the Lions. Then you fast forward yep. to the prelims. Whoever wins this weekend, I think, gets rolled next weekend by Melbourne and Port. So they then go yep. and play at Optus. My heart says the Demons are ready to bury Norm Smith's curse. 1964 was the last time they won. Norm Smith was coach. Barras was the captain. Barras is still yeah. around. Bailey Fritch is wearing 31. Barras wore 31. You know, the last time they were minor premiers, 64, they won the flag. They've been minor premiers nine times. Eight times they've gone on. and you know, They've been in such dark places. Mm. The irony of them winning, not at the MCG when all of the members can't see them, sort of how it is. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think Melbourne have got enough players playing their best footy and they feel a bit like the Dogs did in 16 and Richmond did in 17 where they're just believing. I think Goody's got them in a great spot. Goody was under fire and should have been sacked. They got to yeah. go back. It's like, <laughs> I, hands up. I'm one of Goody's. I'm a mate of Goody's. We walk, we talk, we text. I love him. I want him to win the um, flag for his, you know, all the reasons that would be fun to see the, these win the flag. So I think they can win it. Uh, I think they'll get to the granny. I, I hope to see these ridiculous scenes if they do. Yep. Uh, I think Port can win it. Love Trav Boak. Uh, love Ollie Wines. Love Ken Hinckley. Would love to see Bont, you know, be the third captain of the dogs to win it. Um, I think they're the three, but I think Melbourne and Port play in the granny. Yep. I, I'm biased because I've got to go for the Bulldogs. But um, I hope you don't sit in the top two for 19 weeks. And have a no. percentage of 130 mm. plus, unless you've got the right stuff. They've just yeah. got to find the right stuff for the next three weeks. Yeah. Mm. I'm actually really disappointed because I'm an Eagles fan, home. Hey? So the fact that the grand final is in Optus, it just it makes a little bit sick in the tummy because of you know how good we've been there. But I'll cop that. And I think the dogs are the days for okay. me. Well but we'll see. We'll see. Um we'll wrap it up there. But thank you so much for joining us today. It's it's genuinely been that good, just chatting about, you know, broadcast in general. But I think you've just brought to life a bit of just life advice for everyone who's listening. And a lot of people who listen to this podcast are either early in their career or they just love sport um, and they, they want to get to a place that they're dreaming to get to. So I think all the advice that you've given has been absolutely awesome. So thanks a lot again and uh, good luck for... Uh, well, the match tonight and also the brown line in a few weeks. Pleasure, Ryan. What's the timing you think on proposal? Well, mate, I guess now that this has happened, I've got to, I firstly got to check my bank account just to see if I can actually purchase <laughs> some sort of ring. But as we've seen in recent years, Adam Cooney proposed with a chiesel. So I, was I guess say, that's it doable. Might be up your alley. <laughs> you know, um, I, this is, I, not many people know this. This is a sports grade exclusive. So I was in Argentina and we're about, I was, I'd been seeing my wife for a year and I knew I was going to marry after three months. We we're about to go into an area called Barilocci that had no phone service, nothing. You know, and we we're going into the mountains. And, and on the way, we we're getting on a bus, 12 of us, to go to this. We we're riding horses for a week, you know, swags and camping. I thought, I reckon I'm going to ask you to marry me. Now, as I was running to the bus, there was a tattoo shop that I was walking past. And in the front of the tattoo shop, there was a box of rings. In the rings, I went in, just, I said, do you have a ring that would fit a girl? And he goes, well, how big is your girl? Like, <laughs> because he didn't speak very good English. I said, well, quick. She was walking to the bus. I said, that's her walking down there. She goes, hmm. So he went and I said, I don't want skull and crossbones because there's a skull and crossbones. I don't <laughs> and the, 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 the sort of the symbol of... Um, Argentina is the fleur de lis, and there was a silver ring with the fleur de lis on it. He said, This is the smallest one, and this is the most sort of neutral ring. I said, That'll do it. That'll do it. I said, How much is that? He said, It's eight bucks. <laughs> I bought the ring and I asked her to marry me with that. I then bought her a ring subsequently. You know, she wears the eight dollar ring every day. <laughs> that is unreal. <laughs> that's brilliant well, that's giving us hope that, that's, there you go. so mm. if you've got eight bucks eight, yeah. just exactly. ask someone and see it value is not always represented by price so he wears it take, every day 
We love sports grad exclusives. So mm. awesome, home. We'll let you get back to prepping. Uh, but yeah, thanks again. Pleasure, guys. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks, Ron. Well, there you have it, Rubes. I almost need to take a breath. Uh, that was quite the episode um, and so many, you know, just great points that he raised just about career advice but also life advice and there's so many things that stood out to me. So I'll start with you. Uh, that was brilliant. You're absolutely right. I need, I need to calm down after that. I've never been so engaged or switched on for 45 minutes of my entire life before. <laughs> um I'm tr- still trying to absorb what just happened and what just came in and, and what exactly to, to make of it all. But Hamish was absolutely brilliant. And I think the one thing that stood out is just his ability to tell a story. He had us hooked right from the start mm. when he, you know, told us about your upcoming engagement, which congratulations, Ryan, is Thank extremely you. exciting. No, thanks. Um, but as he said, when you're going out there to tell your story, make sure you're telling it with passion and enthusiasm wherever you go. Because as he says, at the end of the day, if, if someone's got a choice between you and someone else they're going to go with the person who they like more who they're connected with more and if you can understand how to tell your story then you're going to be in a much more favorable position ryan yeah absolutely he he spoke about some tips around you know how you can um interview better i guess and come across in the right way and look really um you know curious and passionate about what you want to do and he said the curiosity part is really key because he, he almost said, learn more about the interviewer in advance of an interview mm. than you would about actually the organization or even preparing yourself. Like if you can connect with the, the person on a personal level and understand where they're from, I think he used a few examples like their dog's name, that kind of thing. <laughs> probably a little bit unrealistic in terms of like a job interview. You're probably not going to know someone's mm. dog's name. But I guess just looking into what they've done and the roles that they've held and, you know, as well as the the company info mm-hmm. and all that kind of thing, but that'll allow you to connect with them on a personal level, which is a huge tick. Yeah, and that just kind of highlights the importance of networking, so that you've got at least someone on the inside of every organisation you might have to apply for, so they can kind of give you that information. So you might know someone in the digital department, but you might be applying for the high performance department. Yeah, but that person in digital can just tell you everything about the person who you are interviewing with. And sometimes that's enough information to then give yourself a leg up. Yeah. Uh, and on that note, um, preparation was a key theme of Hamish's success, a key theme of what makes Bruce McAvaney incredibly good at what he does. Um, I think Hamish mentioned Bruce will get three hours sleep a night during the lead up to the Olympics and yeah. during the Olympics because he's just researching so much of the time. And it's such a, a good point to make that, you know, you might – do 50 hours of preparation you know in bruce it's probably only a few a few days he'll do 50 hours of preparation but you don't know which one or two hours of preparation you'll actually need to recall um and the same goes when you're trying to network if you're going out there to meet people so that you can get a leg up in an interview at some point in time do your preparation before you go to meet those people and the network is perfect for this run it's kind of exactly why we bought it so you've got on a bit of paper exactly who you're meeting, why you're meeting them um, and what you're trying to achieve from it and what they might achieve from it so that you can pull on, you know, bits and pieces of that as you need. But uh, preparation, if you're going to take one thing away from this episode, do your preparation. Yeah, I love that point around like do the few hours of preparation, but you don't know there might be a little bit that you need. A lot of it you might mm. not need, but you don't want to be caught out. So that was a yeah an interesting one. Um I've got one more and I think one of the great messages that I got from Hamish was to be kind, empathetic and not to compare yourself to others. I Mm. think it seems like that is kind of the way that he operates his life but also his work as well. Um, And I think it's just it's a great message for everyone out there. Like be kind, empathetic but also you're never going to be happy if you compare yourself to others because you're never going to be the same as someone else. Mm. um so it was just a great lot i mean just life advice to be honest um mm. I, I, I love that yeah it was nice hearing it from a person of, of hamish's stature who a lot of people look up to um yeah. just to remind us that you know these are the most important things yeah all right we'll, we'll leave it there um be sure to connect with us on linkedin we'd love to chat with you 
on there. We'd love to chat about what you're up to or any questions that you have for us. So you can find a link to that in our show notes below. Um, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.